Hey everyone, welcome to Matters of State, where we discuss and explore underreported topics, news, and issues that should matter to all of us. We're not in Foggy Bottom today. Uh, we're actually sitting here in the heart of Adams Morgan. I'm Drew Casey. I'm joined by uh, Grace Chesson and Kevin Ferdosi. And today uh, we have a special guest, Elizabeth Ramey. Elizabeth is the program associate for the Africa program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. She has consulted uh, on African and international issues for a variety of multilateral and international organizations to include the World Bank, the Civil Service Agency of the Government of Liberia, the International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, and she also has her own personal branding consultancy called uh, Mimi Ni. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. What does Mimi Ni mean? Uh, it means I am in Swahili. Ah, fantastic. I am in Swahili. That's awesome. So particularly relevant to our conversation today, Liz spent uh, more than two years working on local adult education uh, programs um, and empowerment programs in one of the largest slums in Nairobi. Uh, the slum is called Mukuru Kwanjenga. And subsequently, she wrote her master's dissertation uh, on the informal housing market of that particular slum. So I'd like to uh, kick the conversation off sort of by reading a quote that you provide at the top of your dissertation that you quote from a, a journal called The East African in 1996 uh, and sort of kick the conversation off that way, if I could. So using crowbars, axes, and garage tools, they ripped down houses and destroyed 4,800 rooms on 400 plots. In a separate assault, they smashed the doors of 30 houses and looted much of the contents. An invading army from a hostile power, a crackdown on drug smugglers or terrorists, commandos staging a preemptive attack against armed-to-the-teeth coup plotters, no. These were Kenyan administration police under the command of senior administration officers demolishing the homes of thousands of their fellow Kenyans at Mukuru Kwanjenga village in Nairobi. So Liz, what's going on here? What is this? So in 1996, um, local authorities decided to demolish a number of homes in, in the slum Mukuru Kwanjenga. Um, and I thought this presented an interesting puzzle because the slum really hadn't even existed about four years prior. And what's interesting about the background of this is that the slums were not squatters living on, on land in self-constructed housing, but they were actually renters who were paying um, regular monthly rent for their, um, for their housing. And the, the slum had really just exploded in population uh, right around that time. Um, so the, the purpose of the dissertation was really to examine how did the slum arise so quickly and why did the authorities decide to um, start to demolish around this, this period of time, um, and then what lessons can we learn from the, the rapid expansion of Mukuru in the 1990s? Okay. So you said that, that the slums had only begun to be populated really four years prior to this quote. So this is 1996, so this is like the early 90s is when the population really started to explode in this area. Exactly. So um, the, the slum itself began somewhere in the 1940s um, or 1950s. Uh, so Mze Jenga, um, which Mze is basically like a, a polite term for old man. So Mze Jenga, who the slum is actually named after, uh, came in the late 1950s. But the population was still very small, um, just a few hundred people. As I was mentioning to you, I have a, a there's a map from 1993 um, in the dissertation that the great part of the map is that the legend actually covers almost all of the area that is now Mukuru um, sure. because there just was nobody there. So there was nothing really else to map. But in the 1990s, it really exploded um, in, in growth. And most people just attribute this to rapid urbanization and um, rural urban migration. But I found that that was really an insufficient explanation for growth during that period. So through um, field work and some textual analysis, I realized that it, it really was actually bound up with an issue of land grabbing that was occurring in the 1990s. Um, most people have focused on land grabbing in an agricultural context, um, but it actually also happened in urban areas. Right around this time, the ruling party, Kanu, um, knew that it, it was going to lose power. Um, the country had just transitioned to the first multi-party elections. Uh, so Kanu uh, members throughout the country were really grabbing assets wherever they could in order to you know, preserve the benefits of being in power as long as they could. So, so these are individual members of this party grabbing plots which are accumulating in Mukuru Kwanjenga uh, in particular, not the party administration as a policy 
um, grabbing up these plots, right? Correct. My understanding is that it's more individuals within the, the ruling party. Um, so they grabbed, again, assets all over the country, including land. Um, and it, w- throughout Nairobi, it's not just in Mukuru, but uh, Mukuru was found in a, in a commission that came later to investigate this issue. Um, it is listed as one of the areas where there was illegal grabbing, although it doesn't list uh, who exactly was behind it and, and who the owners are now. So, so, so who's living there now? I mean, are, are, are anyone connected with this party living in, in, in the slums or did it pass off to, to someone else? So this is a, actually a really interesting puzzle and something that I wasn't able to fully uncover the dynamics of um, because the, the folks who own the land are actually not the same people who are the, the structure owners. And I specifically say structure owners instead of landlords for that reason. The structure owners don't own the land, but they have constructed informal housing on top of the land and they're the ones that are actually collecting the rent. Um, it's not exactly clear the uh, precise mechanisms and whether or not the owners are actually benefiting in some way from the, those rents. Um, but one way or another, uh, it seems that the plots were handed out as a form of political patronage during this period. And then because informal housing is so profitable and so much more profitable than the formal housing market, um, and given the proximity to the industrial area, um, it was a really convenient location basically to construct a slum. So I think one of the interesting things here is the you have the perception of, you know, when you think of these large slums as the the people living there as being more squatters. And so you had talked some about the difference between squatters versus informal settlements. So what is kind of the range here that you see? Because I'm sure this is an issue not just here, but in slums across the world is I'm sure there are a whole spectrum of different types of settlements. Yeah, so the prototypical understanding of slums is usually um, people coming in and, and constructing their own housing from recycled materials. And they, so they actually, in a sense, own the structure, even though they're, they're just squatting on land illegally. But really, sometime around the 1970s, um, Nairobi became much more of a rental market in terms of the informal housing. So you started to get the rise of actually absentee landlords. So people who don't live in the community, they don't live in the slum, um, but they might construct even hundreds of, of units in the slum on which they're collecting rent on a regular basis. And so the, the market, even though it's, it's informal in the sense of it's sort of existing outside of the legal housing market, um, it's actually quite formal in the sense that there are um, often agents that will come to collect the rents, there are caretakers that will take care of the property, um, often they'll issue receipts, um, sometimes they even ask for a deposit before people move in. So there's a surprising degree of formality for uh, what we would think of as a total informal economy. Right. So it sounds kind of like a sort of like a gray market, I guess. Would you would you categorize it as that? Yeah. I mean, in in the sense of like a mix of legitimate and illegitimate practices together, and it's really difficult to tease out what is uh, according to regulation and what is not according to regulation. So, yeah, I mean, I guess gray market might be a good term to, to categorize that as. So so because we're not on we don't have our own TV channel yet. Um, could you give us a visualization sort of of like walking through uh, Mukuru? Um, wh- what does that look like for someone that's just passing through? Um, first of all, there's a lot of mud. <laughs> so the <laughs> the ground is is almost entirely made of, of mud of various forms. Uh, I didn't really realize before living in Nairobi how many different textures mud could take on. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you definitely needed to have uh, gumboots or like Wellingtons to walk through uh, on rainy days. Um, and around the time of elections, usually the politicians will come in and put a bunch of rocks down to try to make the road a little more um, stable, but those eventually sink to the bottom. Um, there started to be around the edges when you first enter the slum more formal housing, actually. So there are some high rise buildings that um, were going up during my time there. But then as you go further in, it's much more um, mabati, which is like these iron um, sheets that is the common construction material in Mukuru and in in many of the informal settlements. And it's incredibly dense. Um, The the streets are often very narrow. Um, There's open sewage running around. There's usually some goats uh, running around as well, maybe some chickens. So people do have some livestock there. And then there's a number of, you know, schools and uh, kinyozis, like barber shops and um, women selling vegetables on the side of the road. Um, it's 
again, just very densely packed, very lively environment. Is it is it noisy? Yes, I would say it's definitely very noisy. Um, well, I mean, you just have so many people in such a small space. Um, there's constantly noise going on. You always know what your neighbors are up to because um, they're just that closely packed together. Uh, so as someone who doesn't know a whole lot about slums, you know, I've, I've never lived in one and I've only uh, vaguely studied them. Um, you know, you read a lot about the density and the overcrowding uh, and also uh, unsanitary con- conditions, which are usually inherent in slums, uh, facilitating the spread of disease. Is that also an issue there? Did you see? Absolutely. Um, while I was there, there was actually an outbreak of cholera um, one of the wow. uh, one month. Um, I think around seven or nine or so people actually died from it. And it was quite interesting because, no, I mean, not only is everybody densely packed together, but culturally you you always shake hands with people when you first see them for the day. So it was quite uh, challenging because you had to remember not to shake anyone's hand and to wash your hands regularly to really prevent the spread. Um, and the, the people that usually provided us lunch during the day um, stopped cooking. Everybody had to bring in outside food just to try to prevent the spread of that disease. Um, but it is a very real problem. That's and that's kind of the extreme, but obviously more routine issues of like diarrhea and, and right. other um, illnesses but are But it's common. interesting that, uh, you know, it sounds like they sort of had an informal mechami- mechanism to, to shut that down before it could get worse because a cholera outbreak could, could quickly spread. But ev- everyone knew, you say, to stop shaking each other's hands and to bring food in from the outside and everything. So it sounds like they... You know they're aware of the problem and how to how to put it into it. Yeah, I mean, word does spread quickly, especially around something like that. So um, they, it didn't last that long, as I recall. Um, but it's definitely a, a recurring issue. Moving to kind of the social side, what is the the composition, kind of ethnically, tribally, of the people living in the slum? You see so many people. Is it grouped by? Um, along tribal lines. I know in Kenya, there are a number of tribes and historically there have been tensions between the different groups. So do you see this as kind of a melting pot for all of those different tribes or has there, you know, emerged kind of tensions between the groups? That's a really good question. Uh, Mukuru is actually quite diverse uh, compared to some of the other slums, uh, especially the ones that were known for having post-election violence like Kibera and Mathare, um, which do tend to be more uh, divided along tribal lines. Um, Mukuru is very diverse. It does have a large um, Kamba population, in part because around the time that it was expanding, there was a drought in the area where a lot of Kambas come from. And it's actually located between Ukambani, the, the area that Kambas tend to live in, um, and Nairobi. So it was sort of one of the first areas they landed when they came to the city and many people settled there. But it is quite diverse. Um, you'll find all of the major ethnic groups. A lot of the landlords are actually um, Somali. There's quite a large Somali population in general. Really? And many of them are, are landlords as well. I sort of uh, speculated in my dissertation that this may be in part due to the collapse of the Somali state that was also happening around the same time. Um, And there was quite an influx of Somali investment in Kenya because people needed to find something to do with their their resources, with their their money. So uh, Somalis, I hypothesize, may have invested a lot in in housing as well. So going along with that, um, how much interaction and integration does uh, the slum and slum residents have with the rest of the city? I'd say it varies quite a bit. Um, There are definitely, I mean, a lot of the adults work in the informal uh, or in the industrial area, excuse me. Um, So they regularly leave the slum um, and may travel around. Um, It's also very common for people to leave to go back to their rural areas, uh, especially the older generations. Uh, People don't tell you that they're from Nairobi. They'll say they're from their, their rural home. So they will leave regularly, um, leave the city to go up, up country is basically anywhere but Nairobi, um, especially around the holidays. Um, but having said that, a lot of children have n- actually never left the slum before. And sometimes the, the school I was working with would take them maybe on a field trip. And it was f- kind of fascinating to ride the bus with the kids because they were just like amazed to see other parts of, of their own city, but they really had never left their community before. So we talked earlier, I'm sorry to, to backtrack a little bit, but we talked earlier about uh, some of the conditions there um, and also some of the factors that drive people into the slums, you know, from, from the countryside. Uh, I understand what drives them to the slums, but what, what keeps them there? Is it the jobs in Nairobi? Is it still worth it 
it sounds like it would be better to to be back in the countryside where they're where they're from. That's also an excellent question and something I really puzzled um, over quite a lot during my time there because I mean while I don't want to dwell on the the negatives of the slum and you know every article written about it talks about flying toilets and people you know uh, defecating in plastic bags and throwing it out their front door and there's so much more to the slum than that that I don't like to really focus on that too much Um, but it is true I mean these are not sanitary conditions that people are, are growing up in And it's important to realize that there's also really a gradation of poverty. So there are people who live in the slum who could afford to live elsewhere. And it was really a puzzle for me why you would choose to expose your children to the the kind of diseases and and other um, challenges that they face living in a slum community when you you do have the ability to live elsewhere. But I think a lot of it is affordability. Uh, If you have a tight income, it will go a lot further uh, in a community like Mukuru. And Mukuru tends to be less expensive than some of the other slums as well, particularly because it is so close to the industrial area and you can get a lot of black market goods pretty cheaply. But it's also, in general, it's about education in terms of the the rural areas. A lot of times people move not only for jobs, but because the education quality is just much better in Nairobi. So they really want to give their children a chance to have a, a better quality education in the hopes that they will obviously advance economically in the next generation. And so I think that's a major driver of rural urban migration in Nairobi. So the children in, in Mukuru and in, in slums generally in Nairobi have the same access to educational resources as other parts of Nairobi? It, it depends on what you mean by the same. They do have access to education. Obviously, the quality varies quite a bit and the, the size of the schools um, and, and the kind of education that the schools can provide varies tremendously. Uh, I was working in a school that had 1,800 children in it. So it was just a massive, massive school. How, how big were the classes, if you remember? Um, I think individual classes would have maybe 60 or so students at a time. Wow. So it's, uh, and they actually provided a pretty good education, um, particularly given uh, resources. So, th- you know, that particular school would have occasionally, where they would have field trips. They planted a lot of trees on the plot, um, and they're really the only trees that exist in Mukuru at all. So it was kind of a nice oasis within the, the broader community. Um, but I would say those kids were pretty lucky because that school was quite uh, good. There are many others that are really just somebody started it in an extra room uh, in their house and maybe has 20 kids in it um, and really don't have a lot of resources uh, to provide. So we were talking about the rural to urban migration, and that's something that really isn't slowing down. If anything, it's picking up. And so what do you see? Is there a lot being done to address this problem moving forward? Either, you know, I know for you specifically looking at Mukuru, but also globally in cities around the world, both by international actors or by, you know, in this case, the Kenyan government itself. And are those being successful? I think that the development field is really behind the curve on this one. Uh, so broadly speaking, while there is kind of growing emphasis on cities, um, the world has been more than half urban since 2007. And uh, really, there hasn't been the kind of emphasis on urban development that there needs to be. It is much, much easier to provide services while a city is still growing before it gets to the level of like a Nairobi. In fact, a lot of people who work on um, service provision and urban planning have kind of given up on Nairobi because it is such a, a dense environment. It is so politically charged. It's really difficult to do anything. I mean, you, you, even if you just wanted to, say, improve the main road and pave the main road in the community, you would have to displace a certain number of people to do that. And that's obviously going to be a very um, politically charged uh, policy. So this is our moment. This is the chance, really, when we can be investing in secondary cities um, throughout Kenya and throughout other countries as well, um, because it will be much, much easier to provide these services before this, the populations really explode. Um, but you just don't see quite enough attention to that. And I think there's still a focus on agricultural development um, and food policy. And that's not to say that those issues are not important, but really the future of the world but the present of the world is urban and we need to start thinking that way. Do you see that in a lot of cases, politicians just don't see the, or there isn't an incentive to focus on this aspect? Um, 
especially when perhaps slum dwellers or those the you know the poor populations might not provide the the kickbacks or the you know political support that you know drives their their administrations yeah it actually inverts this uh theory of urban bias which basically says that um, politicians will invest more in urban areas because they urban populations pose a greater political threat right they're right in the capital so if anybody's gonna revolt against the current regime it's gonna be people in cities so it, there's been this notion throughout the literature that urban populations actually have it much better than rural populations um, and while rural poverty is absolutely a problem as well, um, there's there's just a lot of variation. And I think a lot of slum dwellers are left behind. Or as I mentioned, they, they only get something around the time of the elections. So they come in and, and dump rocks along the road or they might hand out um, food or other um, goodies to to people around the time of the election. And then they're largely forgotten in between the election cycles. So it's it's not there isn't the level of sustained investment that there really needs to be in, in the urban population, for sure. So, so it seems like um, a lot of other uh, aspects of life anywhere that the change in the situation or inability to change um, in a situation is dependent on sort of political cyclicality, these cycles of uh, political fortune. So could you give us a brief sort of intro into what the politics in Nairobi as a city and then what national politics in Kenya uh, have in store for the future possibly of, of Mukuru specifically or uh, slum life in Nairobi generally. This is where I get really pessimistic about the future of Nairobi. So as I mentioned, because a lot of the land had been given out as a form of political patronage um, and, and then subsequently um, dispersed rights to build structures um, on that land, a lot of the informal, um, or the absentee landlords, the ones who own a lot of structures but don't live in the community, many of them are politicians and high-level businessmen in Kenya. So part of the reason why Nairobi is so bad, um, given the sort of overall economic trajectory of Kenya, is because of that political dimension. There are countries that are much poorer overall that have better slums and, and better sanitation and, and water access in their slums than Nairobi does. Um, and it really is that political dimension in Kenya. There's just, there's no incentive because a lot of times it is those very structure owners are the politicians that have the power to make decisions over the communities um, and could initiate improvements uh, if they w wanted to. But they, they literally have a financial incentive to keep the system the way that it is. And also the communities themselves are quite political. It's very difficult uh, to necessarily get the community all on the same page to agree to do something united. Um, although, as I said, Mukuru is quite ethnically diverse and did not have the same kind of uh, violence in the 2007-2008 um, elections that some of the other communities did. Um, ethnicity is still an issue. There's still a lot of local politics around who do you identify as a community leader and how representative are they of the general population. Um, so this is not an easy environment politically to operate in. And it's it, I think it's quite difficult to get consensus. And as I said, that's a reason why a lot of urban developers are really turning to other cities like Nakuru and, um, and uh, Nyeri and other cities around um, Kenya because it's just a little easier to operate there. Also, to, to add to that, an, another challenge is that um, organizations like uh, UN Habitat or the World Bank, you know, are explicitly apolitical institutions. Obviously, the work that they do is quite political, but I, I literally spoke to a, a, someone from UN Habitat who said, oh, we don't do the politics. And I was like, well, then you're not going to accomplish anything in the slum because everything is so political. Unless you're engaging with those politics, you won't be able to accomplish anything. So there is that tension and that there's still a tendency in development to see things as in technocratic terms. You know, how do we provide water and sanitation without taking into account the broader political dynamics? Is this is this more of a moral dimension? Like we just want to develop places. Uh, we don't want to get involved in politics. Or is this uh in a sort of apathy towards trying to understand the complexities of a local situation on the ground i think it's a mix uh to some extent it's a tendency to uh, have people who come from a more technocratic background coming in to come up with solutions um 
to what they see as technocratic problems. And that's really been the history of development broadly. It is messy. Politics is messy. It's hard to figure out who to back uh, and who to support. You always create winners and losers in any system. So I think it is easier to engage on a technocratic basis, but it is also, I think, less sustainable because eventually the politics will overcome any project that you're working on. Okay, so question here. If you were to have your own program, what what would you do to alleviate this situation? Would it be something constructing more affordable housing units so that people had more opportunities or developing the infrastructure within the already existing slums? There seems to be an imbalance um, in the emphasis of these NGOs and international organizations that are working on this issue. You know, the emphasis that is being placed, a lot of them seem to be working solely in the biggest slum, you know, in the city. So how does that factor into to this issue? Do you think that more resources need to be spread out or what would you do in this situation, I guess, is the broad question, which I know is very difficult. Yeah, I think I'm better at critiquing than I am at providing solutions. But um, first of all, to the point about uh, the imbalance of resources, this is absolutely a problem. Um, so Kibera, the the largest slum in Nairobi, uh, gets a dramatically disproportionate amount of attention and resources to the point that I think it's really distorted the dynamics in the community. Um, one Kenyan I know likes to refer to this as subsidized poverty because so many groups come in, they operate for short periods of time, they provide resources, um, they create a sense of dependency, and then often they, they leave, they close up shop, and those people go on to the next organization. To some extent, this is happening in Mukuru as well, although it is to a lesser extent, um, but you really get very um, different philosophies of, of organizations. So... The, the group I worked for uh, believed very strongly that people had to have buy-in into the program and had to provide some sort of resources into whatever we were doing, um, whether that's financial or just the time investment that they were putting into really developing their own community. But frankly, it was really difficult because you have an NGO literally that was across the street from us that would hand everything out and would pay people sitting allowances to come for their seminars. And so people will just go from seminar to seminar and training to training and collect their 500 shillings for the day. And and that's it. You know, they may never use that training. They may never use that knowledge. Um, and there's not a strong sense necessarily of uh, volunteering and of giving back to the community. Um, there is this Kenyan notion of harambe, which is like, you know, we all need to come together and invest um, in our community. But I, I found that in practice, it was quite difficult um, because these outside groups had really distorted, I think, the, the dynamics in the, in the community. So in terms of solutions, I think it really has to start with the community itself. I mean, that's almost cliche to say, but it is just so true. And the, the programs I've seen that have been the most successful, um, like Pamoja Trust, um, have really been trying to do a very small scale rebuilding of better quality housing and doing sort of collaborative designs of the housing uh, with members of the community to say, what would you like in your ideal building? You know, what resources do you want? Um, but one of the challenges, again, has been that if you build people better housing, very often people will then rent out that uh, better unit and then they go back to living in the slum and they collect the the rent on, on the better unit. So it's, it's difficult because the, the life in the slum has become very normalized. And so... Uh, even when you provide them with better housing, they they may choose to get income rather than to live in that housing itself. So do you think if you were to see economic conditions in Kenya in general improve, do you see this as providing solutions? Do you think that the Kenyan government with more money in the coffers would funnel more money into the slums or alternatively the people themselves making more money? Or, you know, like you said, would they perhaps you know, live in that nicer unit, but then rent it out. I mean, they're always going to be an Im impoverished people. I think you're right. I think uh, broad-based economic growth is really the ultimate solution um, because as people have more income, they will demand better housing. I think there's a role for regulation as well, although it's quite difficult to enforce. Um, but that's really what happened in the United States. You know, we had terrible slum conditions uh, in, in many cities um, and industrial areas in the United States. And it's really government policy um, driven by, you know, progressives that were really ad agitating for 
better living conditions that really brought about that change. Um, but again, it's about people locally deciding that this is what they want and this is what they demand of their government and trying to hold their government accountable for providing that. And so I think without that sort of local buy-in, it's just it's not going to happen on its own organically and it's certainly not going to come from the politicians themselves. So one thing we haven't really uh, hit on yet is 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 how many people are living in this situation. Like how many people uh, are in these slums in Nairobi, and how accurately can we know that that uh, that those people are being counted properly? It's definitely a challenge, um, given the informality, and also given that people cycle in and out of the slum quite regularly. Again, to go to their rural homes for a while, so people might not be physically present, even though they do live there the majority of the year. Uh, having said that. I think actually the census figures that uh, the Kenyan government has come out with are probably more accurate actually than some of the outside estimates that we've seen. Again, Kibera gets a lot of attention and many people throw around this number that a million people live in Kibera and that is almost certainly not true. Um, the real figure is probably somewhere closer to 400,000, um, although again, estimates do vary. Interestingly, there's one group I, I knew of in Nairobi who um, took an interesting approach to this. So instead of enumerating everybody in the slum, they actually um, you know, used GIS to divide up a map of Kibera into sections and then randomly selected sections within that. And then they had enumerators on the ground to count people within that section. And then from that, they're able to extrapolate, this is what we think the population of Kibera overall is. And the figures they had, again, were much closer to the census figures than the numbers that sort of activist groups will throw out of a million people or 700,000 people. So, so these huge numbers are coming from outside groups that possibly have other agendas or looking for funding or, or whatever to interest in their cause. And the cause might be just, but uh, sort of some of these tactics might be uh, a little inaccurate, right, in terms of throwing out, you know, there's a million people living in this neighborhood. Yeah, and I think it's one of those numbers that once it's out there, it gets repeated. So somebody said there's a million people in Kibera, and then everybody started repeating that because it makes a good story, right? A million people in one slum, that's unbelievable. I mean, having said that, there are millions of people that live in slums in Kenya, but they don't all live in the same slum. Um, they're spread out all throughout the city, and there are dozens of slums in Nairobi. Um, so I think... Part of the larger issue is, um, one, we need to have more accurate data um, and, and know where we're getting our figures from. But two, we need to, to stop focusing so much on one particular community and recognize that there are many, many um, smaller communities throughout Nairobi that are equally deserving of assistance. And throughout the world as well. And I think, I think if, if we could sort of pull back out and sort of look at more of a macro picture, what... What have you seen based on your experiences on the ground in Nairobi and then studying this issue for years with uh, focus in Nairobi? But what, what, what have you seen there that might be extrapolated to slums globally? What can we take from this to apply to this, this situation that we're dealing with? Yeah, I'd say Nairobi is, is very much an extreme example. So other cities and other countries are not as politicized. Um, they're not necessarily quite as dense. Um, and there's not necessarily the same situation in terms of large-scale absentee landlords that themselves have a lot of political connections. Uh, that may be true in some communities, but um, it is particularly true in Nairobi and probably to a degree that is much stronger than in other places. Um, but having said that, that it then sort of illuminates some dynamics that um, might be present in other situations, um, but just not to such a, a strong degree. So I think... In some ways, Nairobi provides us with a cautionary tale and says, again, it's so difficult to change things in Nairobi now. We need to be thinking ahead about this. And cities that are in the process of really rapidly urbanizing, we need to be providing resources now before those populations dramatically outstrip our ability to provide services. And so maybe that's a lesson learned is that, you know, you talked about all of the you know, the small nuances of this slum looking at who is renting, who is benefiting, what is the political structure, how does this play into, you know, the the social dynamics. So I, th I think one lesson learned that you've drawn from this is that, you know, it's going to take time and it's going to take that desire to understand the underlying issues. Yeah, one of the major movements uh, that people have been looking at, especially the World Bank, but others as well, is the issue of titling in, in urban areas and what happens if we give people a title to their to the land and to the structure itself. 
Um, this really comes from Hernando de Soto and, and his research in Peru. Um, and it's funny because I, I read de Soto while, you know, being in Nairobi and thinking this doesn't make any sense. Like the plots in Nairobi are way too small and who would you even give a title to, right? Like there's, there's the structure owner, there's the, the tenant themselves, there's a person who owns the land. These are all different actors. Um, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't work in some context. Um, and as I later learned more about Peru, I thought, oh, okay, I understand now why he came up with this idea. It is a different situation. Um, and so that is an intervention that holds some promise in, in certain environments, but not in others. And I think the lessons from Nairobi are what are the questions we should be asking as we evaluate whether or not it would be effective, um, including who are the stakeholders, who are the possible uh, people that have a stake in this uh, policy and and how do they interact? What is the politics among them? And therefore, how does, should this intervention be designed? So this is a really complex issue. Uh, all kinds of people, all kinds of actors, all kinds of causes in meshing together to sort of produce uh, this uh, this situation, this aspect of human life in one one part and many parts of the world. Uh, like all the topics that we cover on this, um, there's no easy answers. Uh, there's no easy way to stop uh, the conversation, but unfortunately we're running out of time for today. So we'd like to thank our special guest, Liz Ramey. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, have this conversation with us today. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, for more information uh, on this discussion and to see additional sources that we talked about that we used to prepare for this conversation, please check out our website, mattersestate.org backslash episode 15. That's episode 15. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter to get our updates. And we're also up on YouTube. Tune in to us next time. Thanks for listening. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on the mode of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction 